Every story has a theme, and it takes a discerning reader to discover it. If there's a theme to the tribulation and the book of Revelation, it is that Jesus wins. <laughs> Good ultimately triumphs over evil, and before the close of human history, God will separate the righteous from the unrighteous. As we come to Revelation 14, we read something like a Greek stage drama taking place. We hear a series of announcements by angels of dramatic events that are about to take place during the tribulation. John receives a number of visions which are complete in and of themselves but are not necessarily in chronological order. We discover angels appearing in verses 6, 8, 9, 15, 17, and 18. These angels step onto the stage to make an announcement, much like an actor in an ancient Greek stage drama would announce the changing of a scene or the ending of one act and the beginning of another. They announce an, a coming event in prophetic history that will affect the lives of those people who are alive on the earth during the seven-year tribulation period. So follow along in your Bible as I read today's text. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 20. Let's read them together. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. 200 miles of bloodshed. As we work our way verse by verse through Revelation 4, verses 6 through 20, it seems to me that these verses can be outlined under six main points, the first of which is the declaration of the gospel, the declaration of the gospel. Look again at Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Now, I'd like for you to read verse 7 out loud with me. Let's read this together. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. 
We met 144,000 Jewish evangelists in our study of Revelation 7, along with the first five verses here in Revelation 14. And then we met two witnesses, you'll remember, in Revelation chapter 11. But now God sends an angel to fly through the heavens and to declare the gospel one final time before judgment comes. And the angel's declaration is loud and clear. Fear God and give him glory. Worship him. That's obviously, I think, meant to stand in stark contrast to the declaration of the false prophet to worship Satan through the Antichrist in his image that we studied in our previous lesson in Revelation chapter 13. And so we, we see a line being drawn very clearly, the separation of the righteous from the unrighteous, the saved from the lost, the worshipers of God and the worshipers of Satan. Now, verse 6 is the only place in the Bible where the gospel is called the eternal or the everlasting gospel, letting the people know on earth that the good news that they are hearing is, in fact, the original plan of redemption from God. It is the same yesterday as it is today, and it will be tomorrow. There's only one eternal gospel, only one divine blueprint for our salvation. That is Jesus Christ and his incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and exaltation. And at the end of time, Jesus will come again. The only question is, are you ready? Have you believed the eternal gospel? Have you personally and individually embraced Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Verses 6 and 7 remind us that in the midst of judgment, God is always, always extending his grace. In addition to all the other ways the gospel is being preached, God sends this angel to circle the earth and to call people to himself. No one during the tribulation will be able to accuse God of being unfair. Any who want to find their way to him will have the gospel message available to them. The declaration of the gospel. That brings us to number two, the destruction of Babylon. The destruction of Babylon. In verse 8, we read, A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. And so for the first time here in Revelation, Babylon is mentioned, a topic that, by the way, will take up most of of chapters 17 and 18 when we get there. This is a preliminary announcement of the final overthrow of the false city and the world system known as Babylon. Babylon is first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. It was a city built by a rebel named Nimrod. It grew to become a major Gentile city on the world stage, ruling the Mesopotamian region, and ultimately dominating the nations, including Israel. You'll recall that Babylon conquered Jerusalem and carried away the tribes of Judah and Benjamin into captivity. When Babylon is mentioned in the Bible, it can refer to either the actual city or to the pagan humanistic world system that characterized the city uh, and influenced much of the world. Babylon here in the text is God's name for the world system the Antichrist will initiate during the tribulation. Many believe, including myself, that the actual ancient city of Babylon will be rebuilt and that it will become the center of operations for the Antichrist and the false prophet. Both the city and the spirit of Babylon will dominate the world during the tribulation period. And it is that humanistic city and system that God will utterly destroy in the end. And therefore the second angel cries out, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon! The great. Now, the details of God's judgment of Babylon will unfold for us in future lessons. But here in today's text, we read the announcement of the destruction of Babylon. Which brings us to number three, and that is the damnation of the marked. The damnation of the marked. 
to notice what John writes in verses 9 through 11. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Now the doom for anyone who worships the beast and its image and receives this mark on their forehead or on their hand during the tribulation is spelled out in no uncertain terms by this third angel, and that is damnation. They will be tormented with burning sulfur, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for these people. Revelation 13, of course, revealed to us that the number of the Antichrist is 666. And without the mark of the beast, those who live during the tribulation will be unable to buy or sell what they need to survive. The pressure to take the mark will be tremendous, especially when it comes down to a matter of life or death. I mean, think of your own children and grandchildren. How long would you be able to watch them go without food? If someone said to you, all you have to do is just take the mark of the beast and you can have all the food you need, what would you do? But the angel's message in these verses is to remind people of the eternal consequences of selling one's soul for a loaf of bread. There's no in-between when it comes to the gospel. People will either worship God or they will worship the Antichrist. And God is very clear in his requirement. No one, no one is to receive the mark of the beast. Those who do so will do so to their own eternal damnation. Dr. John Wolverd writes, Anyone who receives the mark of the beast shall also partake of the judgment of God. As he or she drinks of the wine of spiritual fornication, so he or she shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. It is described in the most dramatic terms as wine that is unmixed. It is full strength. That is, it is untempered by mercy and grace of God. The same scripture which assures all Christians of the love of God and the grace of God as extended to those who trust in Christ is unequivocal in its absolute statements of the judgment of the wicked. The damnation of the marked. Next, let's look at number four, the death of the faithful. The death of the faithful. Let's read uh, Revelation 14 verses 12 and 13 out loud together. Would you read this with me? This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. This has got to be, I think, certainly one of the most precious promises in all of the Bible, a promise to those who endure the days of tribulation on earth and are granted a rest from their labor. Those who respond to the gospel being preached by the 144,000 or by the two witnesses in Jerusalem or even by this second angel right here in Revelation 14 and verse 8, those who become saved during the tribulation will form, Revelation 7 and verse 9 tells us, a great multitude that no one can count. That's amazing. Yes, in spite of the persecution and the death that will result from refusing to take the mark of the beast or to worship its image, a great multitude will still choose to follow Christ. And this promise is given to them to ease their minds about their future. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. If they die during the tribulation, which they will, too late for the rapture and too early for the millennial kingdom, here's the promise. They will still be blessed. Now, the word rest here is 
used in the New Testament many times to refer to the faithful who have died in the Lord. Death for the Christian is, in fact, a rest, as if he or she is sleeping from his or her labors, just waiting to be awakened by the coming of the Lord. It's metaphorical, not literal. It's not some kind of a soul sleep, as some have suggested. It's just a way of saying that the faithful who die during the tribulation will be blessed in that they have gained their rest. They have gained their reward. It is the death of the faithful. Which brings us to number five, and that's the division of the people. The division of the people. Look again at Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so he was seated on the cloud, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Now, in his explanation of the parable of the weeds in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said this, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, and all who do evil, they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Later in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told the parable of the net. He said, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In these two parables, Jesus describes the separation that will take place at the end of time. It is the separation of the righteous from the unrighteous, the saved from the lost. It's the same act of separation that will take place just before the great white throne judgment when the sheep are separated from the goats, Matthew 25 and Revelation 20. And so we see Jesus' own prophecy about this final separation being fulfilled here in verses 14 through 16. The angel's announcements to Jesus, take your sickle and reap, concerns the very, very end of the tribulation when Christians are separated from non-Christians. This separation, by the way, will be very easy to make since everyone who is living on the earth at that time will be marked in one way or the other, either with the mark of the beast or with the mark of God himself. And the imagery is that of harvest, where Jesus puts his sickle and reaps the harvest unto himself. The wheat is gathered to the Lord. The tares are gathered to be burned. And actually, I should say that Jesus himself does not do this actual harvesting, but it says in the Bible, the Son of Man will send out his angels to once and for all separate the saved from the lost. And it is with these words of finality that Jesus sums it all up this way. He says, then they that is the unrighteous, will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. It is the division of the people. And that brings us to our final main point today. That is the devastation of Armageddon. The devastation of Armageddon. Once again, here's what we read in verses 17 through 20. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who was, had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. 
And the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, that is Jerusalem, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Kind of a gruesome picture. (laughs) The snapshot is of the devastation wrought in the battle of Armageddon. A prophecy about this is found in Joel chapter 3 and is actually fulfilled in Revelation chapter 19 where the nations of the earth are harvested by God like they were clusters of grapes, hence the reference here to grapes and the winepress of God's wrath. Now we'll get to the details of Armageddon when we get to Revelation chapter 19, but for today's purposes, this picture in verse 20 is one that many people find very hard to believe. The blood from this final epic battle will spread out as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Translated into our modern-day American terms, that is about four foot deep for spread out over 200 square miles, which, by the way, is about the size of Israel, interestingly enough. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that when Titus conquered Jerusalem in AD 70, the blood flowed so deep in the streets of Jerusalem that it extinguished the cooking fires in the Jews' homes. Now, when we think of 200 million plus people gathered in a final battle in the plain of Megiddo, just north of Jerusalem in Israel, a cataclysmic amount of blood from the dead is not at all out of the question. The point is that a holocaust, the likes of which this world has never known or seen, is coming upon this earth. The devastation of Armageddon. Now, as we wrap up today's study, let let me just say that this final scene carries the same theme as the ones preceding it, and that is the stark contrast between the true and the false, the real and the counterfeit. That's the theme, I think, of Revelation chapter 14. Satan is the master counterfeiter, and even today he is doing everything he can to blind people's eyes to the truth of the gospel and to have them believe a lie rather than the truth. In fact, let's read 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4 out loud together. Would you read this with me? Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ. Now, there are two practical applications that come to my mind as I think about this. First, if you have been blinded by Satan, and you have not placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Lord of your life, I want to stop right now and I want to pray for you. I want to pray that your blinded eyes would be opened to the truth and that you would be able to see the glorious light of the gospel. Would you pray with me? Father, right now I... I want to pray for anyone who's listening to my voice who has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior and Lord, whose eyes have been blinded to the truth. I pray, God, that you would remove that veil. I pray right now in the power of your Holy Spirit that in Jesus' name you would come and remove that veil that blinds them from being able to see what is true the truth of your gospel. And so, God, I ask that eyes would be opened right now, hearts would be opened, minds would be opened, that people would see for the very first time, perhaps, this good news for what it is, the truth, and that they would respond to it, and that people would make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Lord of their lives, even this very moment right now. Remove that blindness, I pray. Let them see and embrace the truth, the truth of Jesus. We pray it in his powerful and matchless name. And everyone said, 
Amen. Second, if you've been trying to share the gospel with someone, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a work associate, or someone else in your circle of influence, and it seems that they have no interest whatsoever, could it be that Satan has blinded the minds of these people so that they don't understand the message that you're trying to share with them about Christ? Could I suggest that perhaps you just need to back up a bit and you need to pray for them. Pray that their blinded eyes would be opened. Maybe the step that you need to make before you start talking to them again about the gospel, maybe the step you need to take first is that you need to commit to diligently and fervently pray for him or her to persevere in prayer over and over and over and over and over and over and over over again, unceasing in lifting them up and pleading that that in the name of Jesus, the, the veil would be lifted and they would no longer be blind to the truth, but that the Holy Spirit would enable them to see the truth about the gospel. Maybe that's where you need to start. I want to suggest that today. Would you be willing to make a commitment to pray specifically by name every day Not just once, but several times throughout the day, every day, just continually, without stopping, pray for the salvation of the people that you have in your circle of influence who don't yet follow Jesus. I think it's going to all start right there with prayer. The battle is going to be won on our knees, folks. And we need to pray that the veil that blinds them would have no more effect on them at all, but they would see the truth and they would embrace Jesus Christ. I think that's where we need to begin. And I want to challenge you to that today. A study in the book of Revelation. Today we study 200 miles of bloodshed here in Revelation 14, verses 6 through 20. Next up, we're going to focus on Revelation 15, the entire chapter, in a lesson I've entitled Seven Angels with Seven Plagues. That'll be next Sunday. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today and this opportunity to open your word together and just work our way through these verses. Even though they describe the end of the tribulation and some of these things, these announcements that are being declared by these angels as they step forward onto the stage. And a lot of this we're not going to be here for if we've trusted in you. We, we, won't, we won't even be a part of this. We'll be in heaven already with you. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you. But yet it reminds us today uh, our responsibility to share the good news, the eternal gospel with those around us before it's too late. Jesus, you're coming soon. I, I believe very soon. I believe we're living right now in the, in the end times, right before you come to rapture your church. And, 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 and when you come, that's... We don't want anybody to have to go into the tribulation. We don't want anyone to be left behind. So God, lay it upon our hearts to begin to fervently pray for those that we know in our circle of influence who don't know you yet. May that veil be lifted that they could see the truth and understand it and embrace it for their lives. And again, I pray for someone who may be listening to this right now who has not yet embrace Jesus Christ as the personal Savior of his or her life, that today would be that moment. Right now would be the time that they decide to follow Jesus, that they decide to surrender their lives to the one who gave his life for them. Oh, may salvation come, we pray, in the powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen.